moment. Um, I should introduce myself for those that don't know me. I'm Devin Hedemark. I'm the GIS program coordinator for the city of Shasta Lake, and I hope everybody's enjoying their GIS day event so far today. Of course, uh, many of the reasons that we're here to participate in GIS day is so that we can uh, inspire others to analyze and visualize GIS data. So hopefully you're seeing some things here that uh, can spark your interest and, and for those students out there, you know, help you get started with GIS. So um, my presentation today is called um, Public Information and Its Access. And so I'm gonna define what that means. Public information is obviously a broad term. It often refers to public sector records. But today I'm gonna to focus on the concept of a public information map. And so a public information map uh, can really be anything that provides local information. Uh, this could be a map of road improvements and road closures or parade routes. It could be details related to a community event like a street fair or maybe a more somber note like a community resource during a pandemic. And of course, many of us have seen uh, the dashboards that are around related to COVID-19 and many of those are done with using GIS dashboards. And so that is a public information map to an extent. But today um, I'm gonna focus on using, of course, wildfires is a very big problem in our area, in our region. And, and many of you have seen the wildfire viewer that City of Reading has done and we've done here at City of Shasta Lake. And so I'm gonna use that as an example to kind of highlight some of the publicly available data that's out there. And I'm gonna be using ArcGIS Online, which is why you're seeing ArcGIS Online here on my screen. Hopefully everybody's seeing that. And I'm gonna use it to pull together some public data sources and show it in some of the ways you can access GIS data on the web. And so hopefully, if, even if you're not designing public information maps, you'll find some of this content helpful as you navigate the data that's available on the web. Uh, my presentation will cover some simple ArcGIS Online concepts and also a couple of advanced topics. So hopefully, if you're a student, you'll find some helpful material. And if you're a GIS professional, you'll also find something helpful. So also I'll share some relevant blog posts along the way, and hopefully those will be helpful to you later. Just uh, making sure I can see the chat window. I'm not seeing it, but hopefully everybody's able to see my screen. We're good there. All right, so a um, couple key terms here. We're talking about ArcGIS Online. So of course that's Esri's hosted cloud platform. Um, hosted just means that it's a bunch of servers. In, in this case, in Amazon Web Services, it's a server farm. And what that does is it provides what we call scalability. So scalability is, you know, the ability to scale up as a map becomes potentially viral and gets a lot of views. And so the, the advantages of that are that if you have servers hosted in your own environment that have a certain level of horsepower, let's call it, um, they may not be able to facilitate a, a map or app that gets, say, for example, a million views, as in the case of City of Reading's Wildfire Viewer. So that is a huge advantage of ArcGIS Online. And I'll go ahead and sign in here. I'm going to bring up this article for you guys, and I'll post it in the chat. But there's a whole article out here about what is ArcGIS Online. It covers some of the key terms that you'll hear today. Um, when we talk about ArcGIS Online, we talk about a few key terms. Um, we're all familiar with GIS as sort of a, a layer cake of information is a good way to put it. And each of those layers are stored in what we call feature classes. Well, um, in ArcGIS Online, every layer is stored as a feature layer. So we, we have features stored in feature layers. We have feature layers that then are part of what we call web maps. And then those web maps are built into web apps. And so those are some key terms that I'll use along the way here that are important as we go along. Um, I, all I did here was sign into ArcGIS Online. So I happen to be an administrator of our organization, but if you are just not an administrator of an organization, you can create a free ArcGIS Online account and, um, and you can do the same things I'm doing here. You would just land on a, on a different page. So all I'm doing here is going into ArcGIS Online, signing in, and clicking the Map button. Okay, so we're in a map now, and we need to add some content. So this is where I wanted to show just some of the things that you can pull from outside sources. 
Um, there's this great Esri blog post out there that is improving your wildfire maps with these new layers. And these layers are, in this case, current wildfires, as well as some um, information on uh, thermal hotspots. So we have a new tool for pulling in what they call VIRS, which is a set of satellites that uh, I believe by NASA. Oh, actually, MODIS is NASA, yeah. So this is NOAA, but. Um, and they just, they just do thermal detection. So you can pull in these layers from what's called the Esri Living Atlas. And so I'll, I'll post this blog post and let you guys read that on your own. But back here in my map, I can simply go into add layers from the Living Atlas. And I can search keywords like Irwin. And you notice that I've, I brought up USA current wildfires. So here I'm adding USA current wildfires. Um, you can see here there's some icons that Esri provides in the ArcGIS online environment that indicate that the layer is recommended by Esri. It's authoritative. Um, that's really important for you to watch. Obviously, the key to a good map is that it's accurate and it comes from authoritative sources. So I can't stress enough how important it is to you know, watch that as you navigate the data, the environment out there in terms of what data is being published and where it's coming from. So um, there's nothing worse probably than a map that is pulling from the wrong data source and it's actually doing a disservice to the community because it's not uh, providing accurate information. So there I pulled in the wildfire information from Irwin. Um, next, I'll go ahead and pull in those thermal hotspots so I can do the same thing, browse the Living Atlas. I can search MODIS, which is one set of cameras uh, excuse me, satellite, sorry, that uh, provide thermal detection for thermal hotspots. And I can just pull that right into my map. You can click on these and you get more information and descriptions about the data. So um, if you're curious on, you know, the update interval and, and the data sources, all that information is there in, in this description. So of course, it's mentioning that these hotspots are updated every half hour. So you're seeing as real time as it gets in terms of potential wildfire activity. Now, of course, MODIS is known to pick up, you know, things like volcanoes and other hot spots. It's not going to tell the difference between a fire and a volcano, but so you want to be aware of those things, but it is going to provide good, good information on a, on a regular basis. And then I'm going to search VIRS, which are these other satellites, which actually do slightly better at providing thermal hotspot detection and add that to my map. So now I'm going to zoom out just because we don't have a lot of hot spots. Obviously, we're in the midst of um, headed into winter here, but um, you can see the wildfire perimeters now provided by er uh, Nipsey and Irwin, and then you can see the uh, fire points also. And then here's the MODIS thermal hot spots that I pulled in. You can see the pop up here comes in with sort of a default configuration. Um, you can actually customize that as well. Let me just uh, pull up. Let's see here. I guess the chat. I don't see the chat, but well, I'll move on. But um, so these modus hotspots. I'm going to go into my web map here, and I'm going to configure this pop up. And I've saved some pop up configuration where it just kind of makes that modus pop up a little easier to read. So you can actually drop this down and instead of just displaying a list of attributes, you can customize the attribute display, configure that. I'll just paste in what I already had um, available. This is something you can pre-configure and you could spend time on this obviously to make this a really nice pop-up that um, is easier for others to use. And I'll give it a title, a slightly better title. I have this saved as well. And then lastly, I remember earlier we had a presentation from the Nature Conservancy and he mentioned the value of learning coding such as Python, but also we have a new scripting language called Arcade, which is a recent release. Um, and so I have a small, just a short Arcade expression here that does a little conversion to uh, 
to a whole number. So I'll add that. And I'm going to bring up really quick a little post about Arcade. This is an Esri blog post about the Arcade scripting language and the power of it. I'll share this in the chat. And there's just a ton of stuff that you can do now to pull information into your web maps using Arcade. And you don't have to be an expert. So that's the key, is that you don't actually have to learn the entire language. There's a ton of people doing this right now. And you can often just borrow scripts from other people. So I added my custom expression. You'll notice that previously in my configuration, I had a reference to that expression, which really just converted, um, converted the time to a, I think it was the time, yeah, the acquisition. Yeah, let's see. Edit that one. Oh, it's the date. Yeah, it's just converting the date to a local acquisition date. So I've added my arcade expression there and then referenced it in my pop-up. All you have to do is put in curly brackets the name of that expression. And now my pop-ups for my modus hotspots should be a little easier to read and a little more user-friendly to the, the average user. All right, so moving forward, I'm gonna add some other layers from the Living Atlas. I'm going to add federal lands. Sometimes you have to just get your um, keyword searches down. USA federal lands. You'll notice here again, Esri marks these as Esri curated content and authoritative. So you want to be careful that you're not looking at depreciated data sources. And um, pull that in. So this is a feature layer of federal land. And I'm going to go ahead and just update the transparency a little bit, add a little transparency to the data set just so that it's not showing over my other data. And actually, I'm going to turn it off by default. So I'm going to make that something in the map that we can turn on and off um, as we choose. All right, so that's some federal land. And let's see, what else do we want to add here? I want to mention that some of these data sets are subscriber content. So you may need an organizational account to actually utilize some of these data sets. But, um, but you can choose to not add certain layers to your map if you want to do this outside of an organizational account. And I'll just bring up real quick this article. Uh, using subscriber content. So let me post a couple of these in the chat window now that um, now that we've seen some of these, I'll share the wildfire blog and the um, arcade blog and the subscriber content. So it talks about how you can authorize with an organizational account, you can authorize others to utilize subscriber content and make it available to them. So I've added those. I'm going to go ahead and add one more data set. And this, you can actually find this on the web. And interestingly, you'll notice this notes it's a KML. But you can actually left click on this and say, I believe it's copy link address to that KML. And you can add this to your map from the web. I may need to, oh, yes. So note this. It notes that HTTP is going to be discontinued um, shortly in ArcGIS Online. And so it's something that, to be aware of that if you have a map, a, you know, a layer like this plugged into your map, you're going to want to make sure that it updates to HTTPS, which is a secure protocol, security protocol for web addresses. And for now, it's going to let me add that, I believe. 
but oh maybe it didn't oh that's cctv that's the wrong one traffic camera lane closures there's probably the one we want so that's just the the beauty of this is that you can pull from a variety of different sources and you can add these data sets to your map and they they're then updated by the source um, these ones I'm actually going to remove because I think I'll do that later. I can actually save my map and then I can add those to my content later. And of course, our local jurisdictions, Shasta County and City of Reading have a lot of map data that's available to the public. Um, actually, I'll share this one first. This is, in building this map, City of Reading authored a layer of wildfire information point. So in this case, it was mapping the Zog fire. And this was uh, evacuation centers and large animal shelters. And so this is actually City of Reading's um, ArcGIS online, what we would call a REST endpoint. So this is another way to pull in layers into ArcGIS. And this looks fairly cryptic. It's kind of somewhat hard to understand if you're not really a person that's seen this before in GIS. But um, anytime you see a REST endpoint like this, GIS software is programmed to be able to read this URL and it turn it into spatial data. So you can pull these and view these right into ArcGIS online maps and um, various apps that support these web services. So I can actually take this layer from City of Reading and I can plug that into my map as well. And now it's put in an evacuation shelter that City of Reading put out there, an animal shelter, and a large animal shelter. And so I'm pulling that in directly from City of Reading. If, if City of Reading updates those points, they'll update in my map as well. And this is a good point to remind people that you want to coordinate with your local agencies. You don't want to necessarily just put maps like this out without some level of coordination, because especially in a, an event such as a Zog fire, um, you can cause a lot of confusion and actually do more harm than good if you are putting out inaccurate information or you're not matching an authoritative agency who might be lead on a, on a incident. So um, you want to be really careful making maps like this and make sure that you're coordinating with the right people and and or at least putting disclaimers that you're just providing you know wildfire information and that you're not providing other aspects of the incident such as um, you know. Um, evacuation zones, for example. So these, these points, I wanted to show a pretty cool thing, which is symbolizing these points. So I'm going to go into my symbols for these Zog fire points. And actually, I'm going to go back and show them, cancel that, uh, symbolize them by name. And so now you see that it's, it's, classified my points by the names that were provided by City of Reading, Cottonwood Rodeo Grounds, so on. And actually, maybe I want to classify them by type. That would actually be better. Evacuation shelter, large animal shelter, small animal shelter. So I can actually go into these points now and you can use an image to symbolize these. So one really important thing with these types of maps is that you want intuitive symbology. You don't want, you know, something that's not going to be understandable by the average person. If you use, for example, triangles to represent evacuation points, nobody's really going to understand what that is. So NAPSIG, the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS, has a great symbol library where you can pull in stylized vector graphics of a variety of hazards and and um, incident symbology. So you could do maps for flooding, for natural hazards, a uh, variety of, of incidents and use this symbology. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in and see that was my evacuation shelters. I'll just do one of these. I can search evacuation, maybe even just evac. Nope. And I can pull in a standardized symbol for 
evacuation. Oh, maybe I want shelter actually. Sorry, not evacuation. Yeah. So here's a standard symbol for animal shelters, for human shelters. And I can pick one of these. And I can pick the file type. And I can actually just copy the image's address. And I can put that directly into my symbology here click the plus sign, and it'll actually add that symbol to my symbol set in ArcGIS Online, make that point larger. And now it's pulling that symbol from the NAPSIG symbology into my web map and making that far more intuitive. So that's, I'm just gonna do that one in the interest of time and just kind of show how you can pull these things in. And of course you can, You, of course, you can, um, you know, uh, change the names on that symbol, or on the symbol classifications, that kind of thing. You, you know, make changes that you want to make to make the map something that's ready for prime time, so to speak, and ready to be shown to the public. So I'm going to save this map, and we're going to call it the public information map, EIS day. Add a tag, um, let's see, I'll just put in City of Shasta Lake and put in GIS day. Normally you'd wanna give a, a good description here. If you're gonna be providing public information, you wanna share what, what it is your maps intends to, intends to do. And the last thing I wanted to show in terms of pulling from outside sources is that Shasta County GIS. So let's go back there. I don't know if you guys got that feedback or not. Anyway. Yeah, we did. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go to Shasta County's map viewer. You notice that when I pulled from City of Reading's GIS services, these REST endpoints all follow a similar string of ArcGIS REST services. So they're usually hosted either in ArcGIS Online on a, on a portal, an enterprise portal in ArcGIS Online, and, or an ArcGIS server or enterprise in an internal organization, but they always tend to follow sort of a, a server name or web address and ArcGIS REST services. And so you can actually go to an organization, an organization like City of Reading or um, Shasta County, and you can take, say for example, their server and you can put in ArcGIS REST and you can get behind the scenes on, on their ArcGIS server information. Of course, there's security to this. So when you click on these things, you're not allowed to access internal information. That's properly handled security. That's a good thing to see. But if it's public, they have all the things that are available on their public side available to pull into your maps. And so I was gonna go in and pull in this base map service. I happen to look at this ahead of time just to see that it had Shasta County's boundary. You can see the layers available here. And I'm going to pull that into my map just to kind of illustrate how, and this could be Shasta County, it could be City of Reading, you could live somewhere else in, in another jurisdiction and often they'll have services available to the public. And you can pull that into your map in the same way that you did the other layers. And so now I'm pulling in Shasta County's overlay for their county boundary and their roads, but maybe I don't want all of that. I don't want the highways or the lake. So I can turn those things off and just maybe, for example, use the Shasta County boundary, give it an outline color, some thickness, and make sure it's not 100% transparent. And there you go. Then you have a Shasta County boundary that's served by Shasta County that um, you don't need to pull that into your organization and duplicate it. So I'm going to save that. And I could rename these, remove, I should re rename these, remove certain layers, uh, things of that nature. Now, another thing to consider here is that I did pull in from Shasta County's internal GIS. And so if you're truly trying to make this scalable and 
you know, you, you think it's going to go viral, you want to be considerate that that's probably not a good use of that layer because you're going to put, you, you may not be able to support the resources you need to have this map be viewed by a lot of people. So I'm illustrating that because this doesn't have to be wildfires. This could be a parade. Like I said, it could be a street fair and you could just want to pull in layers that are, it's probably not going to be something that, you know, is going to necessarily go viral. So I'm going to save my map. I'm going to share it. I can share it with everybody. And again, this will just be temporary. And then I'm going to create a web app. So Esri has all of these great templates available that allow you to share public information. So one category is provide local information. And of course, you can do things like look up. They have templates for information lookup, what's nearby, so on and so on. But they have this great public information template. So you can just utilize that template and publish an app. And that is the gist of what I wanted to show today. I'm running a little out of time, so I'll let this thing just load and then I'll finish up. So see, it pulled in the symbology from the Irwin wildfire data sources. It pulled in the hotspots and the symbology for the thermal activity. All that's pre-symbolized and done by, from those data sources. And then I can name this map, change some options, and save it. And if you launch that, it's a fairly nice information template. It has some basic information. You can switch between a couple base maps and you can view some pertinent information and you can update all of these things uh, to kind of make it a more polished, polished map. So last thing I have to say is just this was a wildfire example just because it's something that's relevant to our area. But, um, you know, again, this could be used to do very simple information sharing and um, pull in all kinds of sources from our local GIS community. So, all right, that's about all I had. That was excellent, Devin. Thank you for, um, thank you for sharing that. I, I um, you know, a couple of comments. Um, you know, I really appreciate that you um, really kind of talk quite a bit about best practices and, and being conscious of data sources and how they're being used and, and is this appropriate? Have you communicated uh, correctly with this? And also just your facility at being able to uh, leverage this wide range of, um, of tools that are out there. Of course, um, you know, we are kind of rooted in the last hour or so in, in the Esri products. We saw a QGIS example um, earlier, but um, you know, th there is a lot of parallel activities that could be done under other platforms. I think maybe not quite to the same uh, degree that you could with with some of the Esri. Um, but um, no, that was uh, that was very useful. The other thing I want to say briefly is that um, you know, as uh, we have a, a, a nice uh, group with with some folks that are from outside the area, and and we are a little bit sort of Redding Shasta centric. We've been trying, especially through our North State GIS uh, website to, uh, to, to broaden things out a little bit and to pull in some of the outlying areas. And I thought uh, just as, as an exercise, I thought maybe we could ask everybody that's online right now to list the city or town that you're in or, or at least close to and the county that you're in. Um, and uh, just put it in the chat window and, and that'll just be a, a way of doing a little bit of a survey of uh, Kind of where people are uh, residing at the moment. Um, all right, well, we are um, doing pretty good. I appreciate everybody sort of keeping one eye on the uh, on the on the clock. It's always uh, always a little bit tricky to uh, manage the time, but um, we are uh, coming into our last hour. And um, let's see. I guess um, it might be good to uh, to check in and see how our, our web map is coming along and I'm not finding the link at the moment uh, but maybe maybe uh, 
as we get into the next presentation, we'll uh, put the link out there for the for the web map, and you can check it out on your own and, and contribute if you have not yet uh, if you've not yet done so. And then um, the uh, the last presentations that we have today um, is going to be from um, Dave Druitt and Steve Kincaid from the city of Reading. And uh, we've actually built our North State GIS website on the Esri Hub product. And so um, I don't know if we would call ourselves one step ahead or one step behind the, uh, the Esri curve. They throw products at you so quickly, it's hard to keep track of things. Uh, but, uh, but certainly we've, we've done a pretty good job, I think, of leveraging the tools that are out there. And um, we're gonna be hearing a little bit about this, including the dashboard, which has become um, quite uh, useful and, and widely uh, distributed. And again, um, I'm gonna go ahead one more time and, and post out our uh, kind of all the links and all the maps from the talks today, because um, there's some interesting um, story maps. Uh, there's some interesting dashboard examples. A lot of people have seen some of the, uh, some of the COVID dashboards, uh, including one that was uh, produced locally here. So um, without further ado, Dave, are you gonna take the, uh, take the the screen first off? I'm taking the wheel, I suppose. Um, yeah, so it's this is a great piggyback on um, Devin's presentation on ArcGIS Online because we're going to be going over dashboards, um, which obviously you'll produce in the ArcGIS Online environment. Um, so, can you get So dashboards are um, very hot right now. Uh, like Dan said, it's kind of difficult to keep up with all the new technology that Esri is pumping out, but um, it's certainly interesting uh, to try. Um, so we're gonna be going kind of fast today. Um, we're gonna go over making a dashboard, uh, but you know, first, if you haven't used it, dashboards are a great way um, for GIS users to convey complicated and uh, often robust data sets and analyses, um, you know, using intuitive uh, and interactive data visualizations. Um, they're really useful for planners and policymakers, whether that's at the local or the state or federal level or within private organizations as well. Also really great for the general public um, because they allow users uh, to visualize trend. They allow us to show the trends. They allow uh, users to visualize the trends, to monitor status of projects in your organization or your community um, or what have you. Um, and the beauty of- Stop, share, and Marcus, you're-